So I want to thank Muffy so much for having me uh, speak today. Um, I'm going to be talking about how cannabis can help with addiction, and that's actually a topic that's of both personal and professional interest to me. Um, so as she um, told you, I am a neuroscientist. I was funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse to study the effects of drugs on the brain. I published in 2006 on uh, the fact that that cannabinoids can actually grow brain cells. And that was sort of contrary to what we were expecting from all the other drugs that we were studying. <clears throat> but uh, here it was. Um, and that stimulated my mind about going and trying to find out really what is cannabis doing to the brain. I had never used cannabis. Um, here I was, you know, a, uh, a researcher that, you know, was working with a DEA license to get drugs. So clearly I was not consuming myself, but I wanted to learn more. Um, I ended up founding the nonprofit Impact Network, and my newest book, Vitamin Weed, is going to be out in June. Uh, so I want to dedicate this talk to my little brother, John. He died of alcohol and OxyContin uh, overdose about seven years ago. Um, so this is really personal and profound to me, um, the fact that we can actually treat substance abuse uh, with cannabis. So how many of us uh, in this room have lost somebody to substance abuse? How many of us actually know somebody that hasn't died but is struggling? There's everyone in the room. And then if you're really brave, how many of you have actually dealt with um, an addiction yourself? So, I mean, clearly, um, addiction is something that te it, it touches every single one of us. Um, it touches our family members, it touches um, our workplace. You really can't go somewhere without finding somebody that their life has been pretty damaged by it. So it's a pretty big issue. And speaking of that, uh, we have a prescription pill epidemic here in the United States. 75% of opiate painkillers that are manufactured worldwide are consumed by Americans. So clearly, are we in more pain than the rest of the world? Probably not, but we just have a lot of access to opiates, uh, which results in death. Um, as you can see here in the graph on the right, um, so in red is overdoses over the years um, with opiate pain relievers. Um, you can actually see it's going up and up and up, and actually we don't have uh, 2014, 15, 16 on this graph, but it's exponentially going up. Um, at the same time, we're noticing that Yes, we have an opiate epidemic, so we should do something about it. So now doctors are trying to restrict access to opiates, but unfortunately, the patients are still in pain, so sometimes they'll go to the black market uh, for, you know, black market opiate pills, and then if they can't access that, then they go to heroin. And as you can see, uh, with the blue line there, we actually have now a heroin <coughs> epidemic. So clearly, there are some problems with the over-prescription of opiates in America. Uh, today was an interesting day. So the CDC actually came out with painkiller guidelines. Uh, they've been working on this for about two years now. Um, and really, they want to try to limit the prescription of, of these opiates. And they suggest that doctors first try ibuprofen or aspirin, and that if they have to go to opiates, that they should only really prescribe them for three days and never longer than seven days. Of course, this sounds great, right? But this means that you know, there should be alternatives to opiate painkillers because obviously aspirin is not going to be strong enough for everyone. So the thought that comes to mind is, hey, cannabis, is that the alternative uh, pain reliever that we're going to be trying? And in fact, Senator Elizabeth Warren has even urged the CDC and the NIH and all the other agencies really to consider cannabis um, as that alternative pain relieving treatment. Um, she has actually written a letter um, encouraging um, basically research on the use, uptake, and effectiveness of medical marijuana as an alternative to opioids for pain treatment in states where it's legal, and uh, research on the impact of legalization of medical and recreational marijuana on opioid overdose deaths. The good thing is that there's actually been research already on these topics, so um, whether she's not aware of them or whether, you know, we obviously need more research, but we have enough and I'll actually be talking a little bit about those studies today. So obviously uh, cannabis could solve the opioid epidemic that's happening right now, but the problem is that the U.S. government still considers cannabis a Schedule I drug with no medical benefits. So that leads 
the government to label uh, people that use cannabis as substance abusers, right? Oh. If there's no medical use, we're all suffering from marijuana use disorder. And in fact, <laughs> this was the most recent study that, that was published. Six million Americans have marijuana use disorder. <laughs> um, you know, and again, it's all in language and terminology. Is a marijuana user in Colorado suffering from marijuana use? Um, disorder, or are they just a cannabis user? Do we call uh, people without an alcohol abuse problem alcohol use disorder <laughs> patients? No, we don't. Do we call somebody with anxiety a Xanax use disorder patient? <laughs> no. Um, so, uh, according to the NIH, 2.5 percent of our population has a serious disorder, marijuana use disorder, um, and it's associated with disability. Well, of course it is. People are using it for pain relief. They're using it for health problems. Um, and it largely goes untreated. Yes, because they like taking their cannabis, right? <laughs> so, um, and I age with another wonderful study. So, um, there is, of course, real cannabis uh, substance abuse problems. Um, again, uh, substance abuse is characterized not by whether you're taking the substance, but how it impacts your life whether it disrupts um, your work, your relationships, your education, other goals. Um, again, when we talk about cannabis, really the most dangerous thing about it, because you're not going to overdose from it, is the fact that you get caught with it by the law enforcement. <laughs> so again, marijuana use disorder can result in going to jail. It can result in losing your children. Um, and that could sound like you have a substance abuse problem, right? If you're in a state where it's not legal and you're using it, now suddenly you've gone to jail. Now your substance abuse problem has has led to serious repercussions. But again, if cannabis was legal everywhere, we would not see this problem, and then we would have less of this, you know, defined marijuana use disorder um, blowing, in my opinion. So um, a lot of times when we hear the opposition to marijuana legalization, it's because they say, oh, cannabis is addictive, we don't want any more people on these hard drugs. Um, when we talk about cannabis um, and we talk about addiction, really, addiction is also associated with a lot of withdrawal symptoms. Um, withdrawal from cannabis is a real thing, but it's very mild. I mean, we would compare it um, in most patients to something like, uh, you know, similar to caffeine withdrawal, right? So if you don't have your coffees or you don't have your energy drinks, and by the way, I'm an energy drink addict for sure, um, you will get a pretty hardcore withdrawal syndrome. I will be irritable, I will have a headache, I will not be a happy person, and I probably won't be getting out of bed at any time. Um, cannabis withdrawal syndrome is very different, and I will say this, I'm a scientist, but I'm also a patient myself. I've gone over a month and a half without cannabis, um, but as a patient, my symptoms will return. That's not cannabis withdrawal, that's just actual just non-management of my, of my uh, chronic illness. Um, when we talk about uh, cannabis addicts going to rehab, again, we have to realize that this is because of our drug laws, right? When you're caught with cannabis in certain states, you have the option of going to a drug treatment program rather than going to jail, right? So, of course, you're going to say, I'll go to rehab, I'm an addict. And, you know, most of the people in those programs will not actually call themselves addicts if they weren't in the context of avoiding punishment. Um, and then there's the statistic that 9% of all cannabis users are addicts, which is much lower than what we see for heroin or alcohol. But again, even this 9% statistic is based on old data. Um, again, an unreplicated NIH study, I think from like years ago, so um, that's something that really needs to be clarified. Um, it's, that statistic is something we see in the news all the time. People keep quoting it, keep quoting it, they don't ever really know where it's from. So a world without drugs, right? Is that really the goal? Do we really want people not to use alcohol, uh, cannabis, anything? Well, people have been using drugs since the dawn of time. <laughs> um, Dr. Carl Hart, who is a neuroscientist and uh, has studied drug addiction, really says the notion that we should live in a drug-free world is not even worth discussing. It's not going to happen. Um, so we should focus on harm reduction rather than complete abstinence from all drugs, including cannabis. Um, and to, to really drive home the point that drugs are part of our world, even animals get high. Dolphins will pass around pufferfish and get high on their nerve toxins. So even uh, they get socially high. <laughs> yes. Um, and there's a whole another list of animals too. I'm sure you can find it on Google. 
Um, so cannabis has also been demonized because we call it the gateway drug, right? Um, most of us have started off uh, using cannabis as teenagers, right? Um, not because it's um, the drug that leads to other drugs, but because it's really the drug that we have the most access to, right? Um, besides alcohol or cigarettes, it's pretty easy as a teenager to get a joint in most places. Um, but that doesn't mean that cannabis is leading to hard drugs. And in fact, most people who use marijuana do not move on to other harder substances. And this has been proven in several recent studies. So really, um, cannabis actually has more um, use, not as a gateway drug, but as the exit drug. Uh, so when you use cannabis, you turn out that you actually use less of these addictive substances like alcohol, like cigarettes, um, and opiates. So um, there was a recent study by Linda Ryman who, uh, who basically showed that cannabis can be a substitute for numerous different types of drugs. It can be an alcohol substitute, it can be a illicit drug substitute, we're talking cocaine, heroin, um, methamphetamines, um, it can also be a prescription drug substitute, right? Um, a lot of times when we see those little memes and we're going, oh, okay, Xanax, uh, cannabis can replace Xanax, cannabis can replace antidepressants, etc. We see patients actually, um, you know, coming off their drugs instead of using cannabis solely. Um, the reasons for this are numerous. Uh, one is that uh, cannabis is actually managing their symptoms better than their original drug, they have less side effects. They just enjoy it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later um, by specific drugs, but um, one of the things that has come up is not only cannabis as an um, excellent tool for um, weaning off of drugs, but also uh, specifically the non-psychoactive component of cannabis called cannabidiol, or CBD. Um, CBD uh, doesn't activate either the, the CB1 or CB2 receptors. It has in a wide range of activities, um, which I won't go into right here. Um, I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions later, but CBD um, can be a great tool uh, for uh, addiction treatment because it's going to relieve the anxiety that's associated with um, drug taking and drug withdrawal. Um, a lot of different syndromes um, deal with uh, insomnia too, which CBD can help. Um, it has few side effects, um, very few drug interactions, and one cannot overdose on it. CBD is not psychoactive and therefore doesn't involve a high. And again, when we're treating um, people for substance abuse, sometimes we don't want to replace one high with the other, um, especially you know, in sort of rehab type of program situations. Um, CBD is also inexpensive and it's usually available in all states. So um, the first uh, substance I'm going to be talking about is alcohol. So Americans are pretty much all alcoholics. <laughs> we have 38 million adults in the U.S. that drink too much, um, and most don't really talk with their health professionals about their, their alcohol use. But when you talk to m most people, they probably feel like they probably should cut back just a little. We're really social drinkers here. Um, one group in particular that's very vulnerable to alcohol abuse and substance abuse is our veterans, especially our veterans with PTSD. Um, and we've heard a lot about cannabis use for veterans with PTSD, but the thing is that most of them are comorbid for substance abuse. Um, and we've actually seen over the years that there's even more and more veterans that have substance abuse problems. And that's partly because of um, their mental health issues and the fact that we're over-prescribing uh, prescription pills. Um, there was a recent study by Care by Design uh, that looked at veterans um, that were using cannabis um, and, and comparing them also to civilians. So what, first off, um, veterans were more likely to state that they had a problem with alcohol compared to civilians. And secondly, when they used cannabis, they actually show here um, that when they're using cannabis, 80% drink less. Right Now this isn't a very rigorous scientific study, it was just a survey of um, multiple veterans that were using cannabis, but um, that's a pretty big number right there, so it, it leads to the fact that we should really explore um, whether cannabis can help veterans consume less alcohol and therefore probably not die of a drug interaction with alcohol. Um, in the news, there's recently been a lot of athletes and other types of celebrities that are actually standing up and saying, not only am I 
um, a substance <coughs> abuser, um, but marijuana helped me get off of pills. They helped me get off of alcohol. Um, so this is just one of many testimonials out there. So if people are ready to go and, and stand up and say that this helped them, well, maybe it could help um, patients everywhere. Um, one of the interesting things about alcohol and uh, um, sorry, cannabis legalization is that it actually has helped um, reduce the drinking habits in the states where it's legalized. So here we have um, a very, very recent study, and it shows that in the states where it's legalized, like Colorado, um, we actually have less binge drinking in our youth. So um, again, this is something that's really important to me. My brother died of alcohol use um, in college, and so um, if Having access to marijuana can actually reduce deaths um, from binge drinking, as well as liver and brain damage from drinking. Uh, that's a positive. Um, finally, um, there is actually a patent on using cannabinoids like CBD to prevent and treat liver and brain damage from alcoholism. Again, a lot of the times we talk about um, um, getting uh, patients off of drugs, but we never really think about, okay, well, now that they're abstinent, how do we repair what's happened to them. So um, CBD or cannabis treatment might be able to restore their body back to health after years and years of abuse. Okay, so the next drug I'm going to be talking about is cigarettes. Um, pretty much we know that no patient should be smoking. There's a lot of bad things that occur, like cancer. We don't want that patients. Um, there's just only been one rigorous study showing that uh, cannabis could be helpful for smoking. Um, this involved a CBD inhaler. Now, the one on the right is not the brand that was used in the study, but it's to show you that, yes, um, cannabis can actually you know, be administered via an asthma-like inhaler, right, and get a very um, you know, specific dose out there for research. Um, so we can see that in patients that had access to a cannabis inhaler that actually was actually just dosing out CBD, when they had cravings, um, basically that reduced their, their cigarette consumption by about 50%. So again, um, want to have a cigarette? Nope, take my CBD inhaler, puff, don't go and smoke. So um, this, this type of treatment can be um, pretty much duplicated in a patient treatment manner by using a vaporizer or a big pen, right? Um, pairing basically the craving with an immediate reaction. And again, um, you're not going to get this instant kind of relief from cravings if you're taking a CBD pill or an edible or a patch. It really has to be that instant um, root of administration you're getting from smoking it. But we can see here that clearly CBD is helpful for reducing smoke. Opiates. Um, so opiate withdrawal, by the way, is not fun. Um, and uh, here we can actually make a sort of a, a differentiation between addiction and just dependence, right? All of our patients um, will become dependent on opiates if they use them for long enough. And actually, <coughs> recent studies even show that just taking low-dose opiates like morphine uh, for a month is enough to actually cause depression. Um, so there are, you know, brain changes, body changes associated with being on opiates. So it's not the best pills for our patients to be on. And even um, in a patient that is not abusing pills, just taking their dose like they're supposed to, opiate withdrawal is, to be frank, a bitch. I actually went through it myself. I was a pain patient um, in a wheelchair last year, um, fighting for my life, and I went, decided to go cold turkey with the use of cannabis and try to uh, balance out the horrible effects of opiate withdrawal that include things like horrible insomnia, uh, muscle aches, vomiting, diarrhea, um, so many just horrible things. Um, there's an acute phase um, that, you know, you, once you get over it, you think it's going to be better, and then it just goes into more hell, and then more hell. So um, without cannabis, I really don't know how I would have gotten off these pills. Um, so just to put it out there, um, cannabis can be very helpful in helping patients um, be able to make the commitment to getting off of pills, um, whereas it would be just easier to go and reach for, for the next pill, right? Instead, with cannabis, you can actually mediate some of those horrible diarrhea and vomiting symptoms. Um, you can get to sleep. Uh, you can stop spasming. You can just lift your mood up a little so you can get through that next day and also through that um, the uh, post-acute uh, stage where really it's just a lot of mental symptoms like insomnia, like irritability, like anxiety. Um, 
that can you know, cause somebody to relapse and go back to square one. So there's been multiple studies on the effects of cannabis on uh, opiate use. So um, the one that mo people most talk about is that in states where we have legal marijuana, we have a 25% decrease in opiate deaths, um, which again is very significant because we have, um, I think the statistic is 44 people a day are dying from opiates. Um, here we have a study from 2015 that's showing that um, when prescription painkillers are uh, painkiller users are also using cannabis, um, they report that their cannabis works better than the prescriptions they're on. And they actually want to cut back on their prescription painkillers. Again, um, if these people were addicted to their painkillers, they wouldn't be uh, they wouldn't be saying, "Oh, I want to use them less." Cannabis is actually um, mediating. Um, the pain relief and actually um, decreasing desire to take those opiates. And there's another study that shows um, one of the ways that this might work is that cannabis is increasing the effects of opiates without altering the plasma levels. So it's not like they're getting a triple dosage of their, their medications. Um, this one study here uh, by Young Abrams looked at um, MS Condon, which is an extended release morphine, or oxycodone use uh, in patients with chronic pain and just found out when they vaporized cannabis that their pain relief increase. Um, and again, one of the mechanisms possibly is that it's slowing morphine or opiate absorption. Cannabis can also be used in adjunct, um, as an adjunct to um, current uh, detox and um, addiction treatments. For example, naltrexone is a treatment that is used to get people off of opiates. It's not um, it's not a really great method because there is a lot of dropout um, in it, but, but they showed um, when you use cannabis, um, not daily, but every once in a while as needed, um, the patients here on top that were using um, the cannabis actually were more likely to stay in treatment with naltrexone. Um, so again, using this not as an alternative treatment, but in conjunction with existing treatments can be very effective, um, especially in, uh, in in patients that are prone to relapse. Uh, so I'm not sure who in Colorado is currently working um, to, uh, to research or treat patients with cannabis um, as an opiate uh, substitute, but there was a recent article in Massachusetts talking about um, several pioneering doctors that are using this. And so um, I just wanted to put this out here as a resource in case you're thinking about uh, treating your patients uh, with CBD or cannabis for substance abuse. Uh, Dr. Barry Whitman of Canicare Doctors um, did a mini study. He treated 80 patients who were addicted to uh, different prescription pills. Uh, and he found out that uh, with this one month tapering program where he increased the dosage of cannabinoids and decreased the prescription pills, that he had a 75% success rate in treating their addiction. Um, that's pretty huge compared to what we see um, in regular treatment programs. Uh, Dr. Uma um, in Native Massachusetts um, basically said that um, in their follow-up visits when they treated um, substance abusers with cannabis that um, their patients basically don't even want their opiates uh, paint colors anymore. Um, and again, that's fantastic because opiate use is, is associated with liver damage and even death. Um, Dr. Her Harold Oblatar um, has also seen success. So these are all great, um, three great resources um, if you're looking for um, advice in the future about how to do this with your patients. Okay, so Jasmine Hurd is an amazing addiction researcher and it's very interesting because I know her personally um, from my graduate years and she is, you know, a very uh, hardcore, you know, addiction treatment specialist, not a fan of medical marijuana at all. But it turned out that in her study, she found out that CBD in rodents was actually useful for treating cocaine addiction, heroin addiction, and methamphetamine addiction. And of course, as a scientist, when you see the facts, you're supposed to be objective. So she moved into human studies. And she actually completed two different phases of <coughs> clinical trials uh, for CBD for opiate addiction. So the first one um, was uh, completed and published. Um, the second phase, um, looking at using CBD in heroin uh, dependent users, um, was finished but has not been published yet. I think it's coming out in May. 
um, but she saw success um, in both trials. So perhaps it's moving out of phase three, I'm not sure, but um, it's very interesting that this is really like the first use of CBD that's not um, you know, based in a neurological disorder. Um, this is more in the mental health center. Uh, you know, mental health field. Um, other drugs, uh, cannabis or CBD is useful in, in helping uh, addiction of almost any type of sort. Uh, cocaine and methamphetamine use diminishes with cannabis use and can even reverse toxicity found in the liver and the brain. Um, again, because these cannabinoids are neuroprotective. Um, we see ADHD patients often replace Adderall or Ritalin with cannabis. And again, um, we know that there are deleterious um, effects of using stimulants. Um, they can even decrease neurogenesis in the birth of new brain cells. So um, when you're replacing with cannabis, which can grow brain cells, obviously you're doing um, your brain a favor. Um, Anti-anxiety and antidepressants are often substituted with cannabis as well. So again, when you're talking to patients and they have a whole list, a laundry list of uh, pills that they're using, um, getting them down to just uh, one or two, or cannabis alone is a tremendous uh, benefit for them. Um, let's talk realistic uh, ways that uh, we can use these substances in treating patients for substance abuse. Um, so first off, you want to be tapering the patients. You do not want to just get them off cold turkey and then introduce a cannabis. You're going to have a lot of problems, obviously. Um, <clears throat> some people have you know issues of um, giving THC to patients or even the patients themselves may not want it, right? Oh, I don't want to get high, I'm here to get clean, right? Um, but THC actually may be necessary in that acute withdrawal phase. Again, when uh, patients are not going to sleep for two weeks um, or they have you know, severe anxiety or um, you know, dopamine uh, depression or deficiency, um, THC can sort of alleviate that and get them through to the next phase. Um, and then you know, they can make a decision whether they want to keep using THC or, or, or use CBD-only type of products to get them through with the maintenance phase. Um, transdermal CBD patches are right now being used in rodents to treat alcoholism. Um, this has to be replicated in humans, but it's very interesting to think that um, possibly by extended release uh, CBD pills or patches, we may actually be able to help alcoholism. Um, that would be a fantastic way because there are so many people that are struggling with that and die from it. Um, cannabis vaporizers um, for use uh, with cravings. Again, um, this seems to be very, just a smart way of doing this, right? If you have a craving, just puff on your pen and you might be able to get uh, through the next day without, you know, relapsing. So, and that's just a really simple, easy way for patients to understand too. You know, there's no like syringes of oil or this or that. Just puff your pen instead of using your drug of choice. Um, so right now, um, obviously, as a neuroscientist, I'm very interested in using cannabis um, to treat patients um, with substance abuse. We'd love to do research. Um, we'd love to train other people how to use this. Um, use this drug to help people with substance abuse. So we're looking for licensed addiction counselors, we're looking for MDs, RNs to collaborate so that we can actually bring um, this treatment to more and more people across the United States and save lives. So, um, so that's the end of my talk. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that our next impact event, which is going to be on cannabinoid deficiency diseases, is April 9th, that's a Saturday. Um, we are looking for more speakers, so if you're interested, um, we're, we're more than happy to accommodate. Um, you can email me or call me um, right there on the right, or sorry, on the left. Um, so I'll open it up to questions. Thank you guys so much.